So this week started off with some shop visitors. Joel and Tessa on the right, all the way down from Colorado, and then we have Mike on the left from Connecticut. So these guys traveled quite a ways to come down and pay me a visit, and I had an extremely good time. We spent the majority of the day talking shop and tools and everything in between. It was a real good time. Joel is into blacksmithing and machine work, and Mike is into machine work as well. So we had obviously a lot of common, and... uh, It was just a great time, so thank you guys for coming down and paying a visit, and for the gifts as well. I'll show some of that stuff in the future. Take a railroad spike, and I draw it out and get it to width in Mm -hmm. the power hammer, because that's just fast. Yeah. And so once that's there, then on the end, I uh, punch a hole, and then I start pounding drifts through to open the hole up. Yeah. And once... Uh, yeah, I have a small cone that fits in the hardy that I made, and once the, the hole gets maybe half inch, certainly by the time it's three quarters of an inch, I'll have it on that hardy and I'll start like making yeah, yeah, yeah. like this. And then at some point, I'll get this so that this fits on the horn. Yeah, yeah the that's animal, what I was thinking. And, and I go, go all the way it. around. Yeah. And then this whole thing's flat. So my plan in the shop this week was pretty simple. In fact, it didn't really involve filming at all. I really wanted to get some of the stuff cleaned up, my machines wiped off and to a point to where I can use them, get stuff off the floor, maybe mount some cabinets on the walls so I can finally start clearing off all of my workbenches and tool baskets and such. And, uh, you know, just try to get this place in order. Work on my machine layout on the floor and finalize that. Also had another shop visitor as well, one that I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with. So it's a busy week. Real busy. Do some machine work as well. Pictures of the monster. What? The, the, uh, oh, the, the box. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's those, one, of, one of those drums is going to be from the... Are you making like a really big log splitter? It's a... Like an... Indu- the beam is 13 feet long. Oh, wow. Why? Because the stroke is 5 feet long. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, are you going to try to split logs that are that long? I'm going to be splitting. I, I figure I'd split probably. You're going to split the two entire two tree? Two to two and a half foot long logs. Because the, the furnace that I'm getting takes two and a half foot long Okay, yeah. Logs. Are you buying this furnace new? Yeah, probably. It's gonna be, that's going to be the, the big expense. Eh, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good. Usually it it, it all works out. out. Yep, it all works out. It works out usually exactly the way it's supposed to. Yep. Just not the way you planned it. Yeah. But that's all right. This is relatively clean. Significantly better than it was before. Yep. We have to, uh, that stuff's somewhat corrosive to aluminum, so we need to, yeah, we'll, right. we'll spray it off. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna, uh, start making unhappiness on this thing pretty quick. In last week's video, I showed some new cabinets that I had picked up for the shop, and I need to make some custom mounting brackets, because in a machine shop, everything's heavy. And these cabinets need to be mounted on the wall in a way that, you know, five years from now, they're not going to be you know, laying on the ground with all the tooling and stuff that I've lo- managed to load in them uh, all over the floor, or potentially on top of whoever opens the cabinet at the unfortunate moment that it falls. So that's what I'm doing here. It's making some custom mounting brackets. Look at how much that's curved out from that stress that was put into that when it was laser cut. So pretty neat.
So when Al drives down from Minnesota, he usually stays with us a couple days and, you know, we just mess around and try to make forward movement in the shop. And while he was here and I had to take care of business elsewhere, I sent him to the to the store to get uh, my gantry crane, which just didn't work out, unfortunately. Uh, nowhere in, around here has one in stock. And instead of a gantry crane, Al comes back with uh, a shop gift. And if you know Al, this shouldn't be any surprise to you. Uh, but it was a surprise to me. I uh, wasn't expecting this. A new U.S. General toolbox from Harbor Freight. I really wanted the black one, but I'll take the red one. <laughs> they don't usually keep these things in stock, and the fact that they had the exact box that I'd wanted was just absolutely amazing. And uh, the fact that Al picked the exact box that I wanted, minus the color was amazing as well so thank you Al I appreciate that I've been wanting one of these ever since the first time I seen them I got them straight so get over that hump we're good well, nothing to it but to do it let me move some of this stuff that's your bucket in one of the stores it's got a box with handles in it that's a pretty nice lock, actually. Is that already unlocked? No? Or am I just not smart enough to... Let me these off here. Alright. Yeah, see, that's... It's... Let me grab a... There's a clip. There oh. we go. There's a little... Clip right here. Oh, you guys, we're just not smart <laughs> right enough. This little clip there. We're just not <laughs> see, smart is, enough. See, you just had to bring someone who's got a brain here. And... They all have it, so make sure you hit on them. Yeah, that's what it There's is. little thing right there. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I was like, maybe there's something in here. I, I, I couldn't believe that they would. No. Yeah. I, I mean, that's just a bridge too far. <laughs> Come on, really? It's we an... didn't test the locks? Yeah, for the really? night. You know, for the for the money, it's a nice box. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's not bad. Who needs a uh, snap on or a back? Else is... There you go. There's your hand. Yeah. They don't, they don't even give you an Allen wrench long enough to reach that. Nice handle though. Cast aluminum, chromed. Drive out. Oh, all right. Yeah. I'll just go this way. Wait, 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 wait. This is kind of scooping this way. Where are you going? 
Okay. Oh no, I think we scratched it. It's fine. <laughs> Excellent. The only bummer probably is that you're going to have to have two keys. You do. Yeah, you do. It's fine. While it's in it here, it's it not going to make much difference. Oh, on the movement? Yeah. Without that, it would it'd be tough. I just wish it had it on the lift. Yeah, that's pretty close. Okay, can you go down just a, just a tick? There you go, down. Down. Uh, yeah, down. That's it. It's it's on. Yeah. Ooh. I love it when the plan comes together. Yeah, it worked. All right. Now down a little bit. Yeah, down. All right. Let me make sure. Yeah. That's it. Okay. I can use this to stand on to drill my holes. Uh, yeah. So when this electric forklift come up for sale, I really questioned whether it would be something that just sets in my way or, you know, something that I would use occasionally. But to be honest, I've used this thing probably at least once every day since since I got it. And it has become an extremely beneficial tool for me to have. Now, I bought it with bad batteries and I got it at a pretty good price. So I did recently replace the batteries in this thing, $156 each, so a little over $300 for batteries that should last at least a couple years, three years, I would think. And uh, given how much I use this thing, they'll quickly pay for themselves just, just in the benefit of having a lift in the shop. And in my opinion, this thing has well earned the small amount of space that it'll take up and it was a good purchase, despite me thinking I would never use it. Now, will you, will you help? I'm going to get up on the other side. Will you let this down when I tell you just some? I know. I know. It's scary. scary. Don't be scared. Well, you just tap it. I mean, that's all you got to do. Which one? The middle one? The one that says down. The middle horn one? Yeah. You blow the horn when no, I tell you to let it down, okay? Back. No. You just have to push the button. Okay. When I tell you to let it down, all you got to do is blow the horn, <laughs> blow the horn and go up. Again. Do it again. One more time. All right. Thank you, love. Now, now, wide open up and blow the horn at the same time while screaming. 
<laughs> so you would not believe how much time has been burned by simply moving stuff from one spot to the other in order to work in one area today and then you know the next day you need to move or you need to work in the area where you moved the stuff to and then you move it again so it's just been back and forth this whole project for one, I didn't have much cabinet space, and for two, the whole wall was out, and everything was pushed over to this one side of the shop because I had to have room to work over there. So this is a big deal to me because now I have a permanent home for all of the stuff that is, at the moment, to taking up all my valuable top space, worktop space, and floor space. So cabinets are a huge deal. And if you look at the guys that have smaller shops, one-car garage or even smaller, and they work successfully out of the, those spaces, Organization is pretty key, and cabinet space, they take advantage of any area that can be used to hold stuff. So I'm excited about this. Even though it's a simple thing, a couple cabinets, it's just the start, and eventually, all my stuff will have a permanent home, and I'll no longer have to move stuff from one area to the next, and I'll know where stuff is, which is a big deal. So I got a quick job that I'd like to take care of that I've been putting off because the weather's been cold and this stuff requires the temperature of the concrete, you know, relative temperature inside and outside the shop to be around 40 degrees Fahrenheit or four and a half degrees Celsius before it can cure properly. Now this stuff is called slab. It, it says the serious fix for concrete cracks. Well, I don't have any cracks in my new concrete slab, or at least none that I'm aware of yet, but I do have control joints that was cut in this new piece of concrete that I have in order, if it does crack, for it to crack in those joints, uh, you know, hopefully. But this is to fill those cut lines so they don't get full of dirt, grit, metal chips, and you know, who knows, whatever you track in. So I'm gonna cut this open and see how that goes real quick. I'd like to get that out of my way to get it done. So here's one control joint. I have three on this floor. This was cut in here intentionally to weaken a plane in the floor. So if this concrete or when it cracks, hopefully it just cracks down in the bottom of this cut and it, you know, it doesn't crack diagonally across the floor. And if you notice my sealer that I put on this floor is starting to turn white, all white actually. It's progressively gotten whiter as the weeks pass. Now the stuff that I put on here was not necessarily a hard, durable floor finish. Really, that stuff that I used was designed to slow the curing process of this floor and make it stronger and seal it. Just seal it against oil spills and stuff, which it's done a great job. So I'm gonna use the vacuum, suck all the wood chips and dirt out of these cracks, and then we'll run that uh, caulking tube around along this uh, joint and seal that up because it's been a constant battle to keep it clean. trying to push this stuff way down in there as much as I can until it starts kind of beading up not going down any farther it says to protect this stuff from water for 24 to 48 hours it also takes quite a long time to cure as well So after I got this stuff down in the crack, all I did was take a razor blade and run over the top of it. That way it's not proud of the joint. I'd rather it be somewhat recessed than stick up high. There we go. That looks pretty good. Definitely looks better scraped flat. I just used a razor blade. So for the past year, the big Cincinnati shaper has been sitting under a piece of plastic unused because of the condition of the shop during all the construction. You know, I just wasn't able to use any of my equipment, but finally getting things sorted 
and I've got a job to do on this shaper involving some parts off of the do-all mill actually. So I need to pull the vise off this thing. I haven't had it off in all that time. Clean everything up a bit and then we'll get set up and uh, potentially use this thing. So I have started it, but haven't ran it. Excited to get back to, to some normal uh, shopping, to a normal shop environment where you can actually use the pieces of equipment that are in your shop. It's gonna be exciting. So let's get it up here, see just how much this thing weighs. So that's quite a bit heavier than what I thought, 292 pounds. It's pretty impressive.
So I just got done checking to see if the top of the table is parallel with the ram movement, and it is within a half thou over 12 inches. I did check with an indicator on the table and on top of a brown and sharp 12 inch parallel. The reason why I used a parallel on top of the table is because it's nice and smooth and less noisy than this used work table. Although it's in good shape, you just get a better reading using a known good parallel. So that's, uh, that's good. I'm glad that the table's in. I'll check it right to left and call it ready to use. So it took me a minute to come up with something to hold this thing down because it's a basically as large as the table is wide and get something that'll clamp and hold it properly because you got to have more than one clamp. It does have a hole in the center, but one clamp is just a spent point for something to spin on. Um, and I come up with this spreader bar. So it's just a large, large steel bar and uh, I'm going to use it to span across this thing and then another clamp across the hole in the center so that'll give me two two decent mounting points it won't take much to pressure cutting pressure to get this done so i think that'll be sufficient so let me quickly explain what's going on here this is the bottom of the saddle for the do-all milling machine that got a lot of damage on these two machine ways basically i think it was starved of oil and it you know produced a lot of gall in here and the only thing that I'm trying to do is get two nice flat planes here and uh, in preparation for these old damaged machine ways to be coated with a material called turkite and I know a lot of people probably don't know what turkite is and I'll explain it to the best of, of my understanding I haven't personally used it but I've seen it done now turkite is just a thin flexible uh, machine rebuilding or even new machines are a lot of times built built using the stuff so it will be uh, epoxied to the old machine surface once it's nice and flat and then that turkite will be scraped by hand flat now this turkite in some cases you know wear less than cast iron it's not a compromise and it's not a patch in my opinion there are places where it's use is preferred and where it's not but i really think that the underside of this saddle and probably the top of the saddle is a really good place to use that material. And uh, what it will give us is basically a new machine surface that's at the same level uh, that the old one was. So we don't lose any height of this, uh, of this uh, saddle here on the machine. Everything is rebuilt back up to factory specs. That's the idea anyway. So all I'm going to be doing is freshening up these surfaces. I'm not going to be removing all the scoring. I'm not going to be worried about any of that. All I want is to make these flat, get any irregularities out of them. So when it comes time to put that turkite material on here, that it goes smooth. So that's my thought anyway of what's trying to be achieved here. So let me get this thing squared up and, uh, and we'll start prepping these or dial them in and start hitting these surfaces.
that's it. Ended up pulling about eight thousandths off of it. I stopped and, and reset just to clean it up a little better. It was had a couple hollows and stuff in it. So that's good enough. That's not that much material really, but it cleaned up pretty good. A lot of that scoring come out of it. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So I need to do a little inspection work on the saddle here now that I've machined it. I want to make sure that what I want to have happened, happened. So we're checking it on my surface plate, the big pink granite surface plate that was calibrated by Starrett four or five months ago. So we know this is a good reference, good flat surface. And if you don't know what a surface plate is, it is the flattest thing in the shop by a long shot and it is made to check parts on like we're doing. It's just a good known flat surface that I can use indicators and stuff on to check one thing in relationship to the other. So that's what uh, we're doing. I got my feeler gauges here. First thing I wanna do is uh, check and see if I can stick this feeler gauge up under the ends of the saddle. Checking for wear in the top, really. And it just barely sticks. It is the thinnest gauge that I have probably about a thou because this won't go up under there on that end. Right. The top of the saddle on this doesn't look excessively worn, although it does not look new. Can't get it up under there. I'm just trying to fit this up under there because it shouldn't go under there. No. No. So that's good. That tells me that at least on the ends, a lot of times they're the most worn because dirt can get in that spot easier than it does on the inside usually. Um, so the top of the saddle is not all that bad. So let's take our surface gauge with the tense indicator and check these surfaces here and make sure that they are, <laughs> I hope they're where they need to be. Won't come in and zero. First thing I want to do is go across. Make sure that this is parallel with the top of the plate and therefore parallel with the top of the saddle. Zero. And that's good. About a three tenths, two tenths across that. Let's see if it Same, three-tenths. Maybe four. Which is exactly what I would expect. Uh, because that's as good as I can dial in the table that's on the shaper. Really, it's so big and I can't get it any better than that. Uh, not uh, without hours of work. It just I found that that's about as close as I can dial in that table without going back and forth. So if this is within a thou, a thousandth of an inch, I'll be very happy. That's what I would expect. I just dropped off the edge. So there's six tenths right there. High from my zero. Go to the other side, check it. Try not to bump this thing around. Yeah, 
yeah, it's it's within a half the hour or so. Maybe a little more. Six, seven tenths. So under a thousandth of an inch. Yeah. Man, I'll take that. That's pretty good. It's about as good as it could have turned out, really. On that machine, anyway. And that's easily within um, scraping, right? So we're going to be, these are going to be coated and scraped, and that means it's not going to take a lot of work to get these really, really good. So there we go. It's turned out really nice. Just a quick check. So things did not go as planned this week for me. I was really hoping to get the tool in that I mentioned last week and pick up this knee straight off this machine and have this thing on a pallet ready to go out for grinding. But that didn't happen. I'm just going to let the cat out of the bag in case you didn't already know uh, or put the pieces together. I want to buy a gantry crane. Now I know you can build those things, but you can build a lot of stuff and I don't need another project here on the floor. You can't build them pre-painted and ready to go. So that's what I'm looking for. No more projects at the moment, just progress. So I'm planning on buying a cheap gantry crane so I can use it in the shop over all my machines. It'll make it super nice when it comes to loading up the tables with anything heavy because like it's just the vice alone on the shaper is 300 pounds. And it would be nice to just roll the gantry crane over it and pick it straight up off of there. Not to mention on the K&T mill, the lathe, surface grinder if needed, right? heavy stuff. Nice to put it on the table with a gantry crane. Now the small cherry picker works, but it lifts kind of at an angle and it's a little bit awkward. It's definitely not something I want to try to lift this off with. Although you can lay this down and I could get it off here. There's a hundred thousand ways I could get this knee off of here, but I'm going to wait until I get something where I can lift it straight up in the air, move it and set it straight down. I just think that's the best way without setting up cinder blocks and all that other unnecessary complication and work. So that's the plan is going to get a gantry crane. So I think that's it. <laughs> I'm glad that the saddle turned out on this machine as good as it did. That's as good as I would have expected. Any better than that would have been luck. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, subscribers, and anybody who supported me on this project. It's moving forward and starting to come together. It feels good. That's for sure. So that's it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes Hold on to your dream Oh, I know you wanna scream Since the day you're born You're just a flower on your own Waiting for the